you are able to recycle it on your own property, kind of closing the loop around um, your own home of the things that you eat and the things that you read and the bills and the junk that come to you in the mail and not sending them off um, to be recycled in a different way. Um, and by doing that, next slide, please. Um, we are um, receiving a really nice product that we talked about earlier, which is a nitrogen rich uh, compost. Um, worm composting is neat, it's easy, it's odorless um, when properly maintained. Um, and as we were just saying, it's a great way to turn hard to dispose of food waste and some paper waste into fertilizer. It can be done indoors, in a garage, on the patio, a porch, um, in any sort of moderately temperature place. Um, worms are sort of, you know, like us, they, you know, are a little get, getting a little chilly around 50 degrees or below, and about 90 degrees, they're starting to feel like, whoop, it's getting hot in this bin. So we want to be very mindful of those two things. Um, if it gets too chilly for worms, we'll have to bring them in. Um, and if it gets too hot, we often have to bring them in and make sure that they're in a nice cool place. Another benefit is that you can compost year round. Um, sometimes in the rainy season, um, it's hard to keep your hot compost piles going, but with a worm bin, you can keep the cycle going year round. And if you have very limited space, it's a-okay. When I was on the farm at UCSC, um, working for Orin in the Up Garden, and um, one of my jobs was to make sure that our composting program was going well. And compost was the source of our fertility on the farm. So it was very important that we had a lot of it and um, that you know we were timing it correctly and had it when we needed it. But that was farm scale production. And I was all about compost and you couldn't have um, convinced me that there was any other way that um, was just as good as hot composting. Um, but then I became a master composter and um, the master composting program is in Santa Clara County. Unfortunately, we ran out of funds for Santa Cruz County. So I drive over the hill to do my volunteer work and Sometimes we do house visits if people are having trouble with their worm bins, or we go to schools and help schools out with, you know, um, their worm bin program. And I really started noticing that very different from where I live in Watsonville, most of the places that I was visiting were more like apartments, um, condominiums, and even um, some of the small kid groups that I would go to and teach, um, you know, like a Boys and Girls Club or a Boy Scout or Girl Scout troop in a home, a lot of times those homes really don't have a backyard or a front yard to work with. They might just have a small cement patio out their back door and that's all the space they have. So being able to do hot compost piles just isn't an option. So then I started changing my tune and um, fell in love with worms, mostly because it can be done anywhere, no matter what space you have. And um, we've already discussed most of this, but um, the finished product, um, worm castings, which is a polite way of saying worm poop, um, is a nitrogen rich fertilizer which can be used on our plants indoors and outdoors. Um, it eliminates the need for you to purchase fertilizer um, and it's a really fun thing to have around if you happen to have kids or grandkids around, especially during this time of at home education because there is a bazillion science projects that can be taught and explored um, within the context of a worm bin. Another great thing to use um, with your worm castings is if you happen to have any gardeners in your life um, is to gift that, that worm castings to your friends. Um, and if you do that, they're going to look at you like you just gave them a bag of gold. And that's because worm castings are also known as black gold among uh, gardeners. Okay, we can move to the next slide, Elise. 
So on this slide, we are um, going to be discussing different types of worms that are good for composting, as there are thousands and thousands of worm species that live in soil, and we find some in our gardens and some in our compost um, piles. And just to go through the list, um, we have a red wiggler, red tiger, blue worms that are really cool. They look like red wigglers, but they're their awesome like turquoise blue color, but you only get to use those if you live in Florida or some other tropical place. Um, red worm or red earthworm, African nightcrawler, and a European nightcrawler. Um, in our area, um, the best um, worm for us is the red wiggler, the, the, the one on the top. And in this slide, um, what we're um, highlighting here is different species of, 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 excuse me, different species of worms and where they like to live. So there are uh, three basic areas that worms like to live. And um, we call worms that live in the surface area, kind of like the leaf litter on top of the soil, epigeic and that's where they hang out. And then the next uh, class of worms that we have up there is an endogeic worm, and those are worms that burrow down into the ground and come back up, and sometimes they feed up in the soil, but most of the time they bring their food down into their burrows. They like to reuse their burrows. And then we have our last class of worm, which I can never learn how to pronounce correctly, so I'm just going to spell it, A-N-E-C-I-C, -E -C. and that's a, a worm that burrows deep down into the soil. It lives down in the soil. It travels up and brings its food down into its burrows. And the reason that we like to point this out is because the best worm for us to use, obviously, for composting is an epigeic worm, one that's living up in the surface and in the leaf litter. And then we kind of duplicate that in our worm bin where they're living in our food scraps, basically. Um, this is a slide um, that is pointing out a common misidentification um, when we are learning how to become good worm composters. Sometimes you might open your worm bin and you see a ton of these little tiny white worms and you get really excited because you think, oh my goodness, I have so many baby worms in my compost pile. And those are not baby worms. Um, those are a completely... Uh, different type of worm. They're a distant cousin of the red wiggler. They're not harmful. They're not, you know, bad. You'll probably always have a few of them here and there. Um, they're also, you know, doing their job. They're also um, composting for you. But if you open your bin and you do see that you have a, a huge amount of them, like in this photo on the left is, is showing us, that could be a sign that maybe something's gone slightly awry with your worm bin, and you might want to check it out and make sure things are um, healthy and happy for your worm and the worms in their environment. One thing could be that maybe it's getting a little too acidic in there, and that might be time to harvest your worms. Um, it also could be an indication that the bin itself is just too wet. And um, as we get through the slideshow, um, most problems that you have in your worm bin are because of too much moisture, not too little moisture. Um, and then once you see that, then you can go ahead and make corrections um, and make sure that the worms that you want to keep happy are happy because we want to keep our red wigglers happy, not so much our, our pot worms. Um, this slide is um, talking about what the parts of a worm are. Um, worm anatomy is very complex, and one good thing to know is that we don't need to know every single thing about uh, the worm anatomy to uh, be good worm caretakers, just like most of us probably don't know exactly everything um, um, that is related to our dog or kitty's anatomy, but we can be um, good for moms and, and dads anyway. But just to um, kind of go over their anatomy a little bit so that you can um, understand a little bit more how they're working inside of your worm bin. Um, at the front, we have the mouth. 
and then at the back, that's the anus. That's what produces our, our black gold. Kind of behind the mouth area, um, we get into um, their hearts, and uh, worms have five hearts for some reason. I don't know. I guess they've got a lot of love to give. And behind that heart, you will find um, a crop. And that is like a bird has a crop to store food. It's a little bit like our stomach to store food. And behind that is a gizzard and worms digest their food with a little help from some grit that they might find in the soil, maybe some natural sand that they find in the soil. And or um, if they're domesticated worms, um, we help them out typically by adding some crushed eggshells to the bin and that gives them their grit to digest their food. Um, and then this, we're showing the segments of, you know, the worm being able to stretch and contract and move its little cilia. And then from that kind of big band that you see in the middle all the way to the back, that's a really long digestive tract where it's getting its nutrients from and processing our black gold. Um, in, the mid of, in the middle there is the clotillum, and that is the reproductive organ of the worm and we'll go ahead and talk about that more in the next slide. So when um, we're talking about a worm's life cycle, um, worms are hermaphrodites. They do have both male and female organs, um, but that doesn't mean that they can reproduce all by themselves. They need another worm to um, reproduce. So how they go about doing that is when they are ready, their clotillum gets kind of like a bright red orange and it's a little signal that I'm ready to make some babies and someone else who is feeling the same way comes crawling all over and they um, attach with their clotillums and you know their heads are in, in, in opposite directions. And when they're together like that, which is you know for a few hours, they exchange sperm. And once that process is complete, then um, they separate. They've got a mucous membrane that's kind of forming around uh, the clotellum, and that's going to eventually become the cocoon. And they basically kind of wiggle back out of that cocoon. And when they are um, finally through that, that is what seals off the end of the cocoon. And you can see um, in the top right on your screen, the cocoon is kind of like a red, brown, almost egg-shaped little cocoon. And inside that typically is about four to seven um, baby red wigglers that will hatch in two to three weeks. And then at about um, two to three months, a red wiggler um, will develop their sex organs and be ready to reproduce with other worms as well. One thing that is really amazing about uh, red wigglers is that they control their population inside their worm bin, and they do that based on their conditions. So um, cocoons can um, survive for a very long time, sometimes a year or more. They can get through a freeze, they can get through a hot spell, and they won't hatch until they feel like the conditions are right, that they've got enough food, they've got enough water, the space isn't overcrowded. So that, I think that's pretty um, fascinating that they're able to control their own population within that worm bin. All right, so now we're going to move on to selecting our worm bin. And this is um, some examples of some com commercial type worm bins that you can buy. Um, I am not a fan of commercial um, worm bins and um, neither are most of my master composter friends. They're very expensive and they typically don't work very well. And I think it's because uh, the worms that don't have eyes so they can't read the directions and they don't follow them and they just don't do what they're supposed to do inside these commercial worm bins and it can be very frustrating and if you're new to vermiculture and you purchase one of these things and it doesn't work out then you think that you can't raise worms and that's not true it's just that these are not great systems 
Um, if you already have one, we can, um, of course, talk you through it and try to uh, troubleshoot and make that system as successful as possible. But if you don't have one, please don't buy one because um, your best bet is to make your own worm bin. And in this slide, we have samples of um, people that are making their own worm bin. My favorite worm bin and the one that most of my master composter friends is in the upper center, that gray stacking bin system there. And those bins are just your basic storage bins that you can pick up at any box store um, in um, the hopes of recycling. Maybe you have one that's empty in your garage or your shed already. And I know a lot of people are spring cleaning right now and you might be left with an empty tub that you can repurpose into a worm bin. And then on the top right, that is just another example of repurposing a bin in Santa Clara County, sometimes, um, a, a, I'm sorry, a while back, they were having to separate out their recycling, you know, one for cans, one for paper, that kind of thing. And then it got to where you could just put all of your recyclables into one container. So um, people repurposed the bins that they had and turned them into worm bins. And um, what I like to point out on that slide is that you'll see that it's resting on top of two pieces of wood. And that is to aid in the aeration. And also, there is going to be some drainage from the exudate in your worm bin, and that helps it be able to drain out of the worm bin and um, either into another bin that doesn't have holes or onto the ground wherever you have it. And this is, oh, let me go back to that slide. Oops, sorry. That's okay. This is just another example of someone um, repurposing another one of those old recycling bins. And I think this is just a good photo of um, the holes that they've drilled in the bottom for the drainage. And these folks have go ahead, they've gone ahead and added a couple of permanent pieces of wood. So they're not balancing uh, their worm bin on pieces of wood like I do. They've just got them attached to the worm bin, which is probably nice. And a good um, a photo of a starting out with some bedding, a torn up shredded newspaper. And then they've made their own uh, lid out of some old fence wood. So there's all kinds of ways to make a worm bin, get creative, um, and see what you come up with. But if you can, avoid those commercial ones because I, 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 don't, I don't think you'll be happy with them. So any size bin can work. And our great techies that live over the hill came up with this rule of thumb for us. And the rule of thumb is um, that two square feet of surface area per person or one square foot per pound of waste per week is a calculation that you can keep in your head. But honestly, if you just get your basic storage bin from one of the box stores, that's gonna be a good size. Um, you'll typically always start off with a pound of worms because that's how they're sold. Um, and once again, we're pointing out that the worms will reproduce to fill the box, but they'll never overpopulate the box. All right, next slide. Please. I want to hear about them being hermaphrodites. Well, we discussed that a little bit in reproduction, but worms okay. are hermaphrodites. And they have both male and female organs, but that does not mean that they can reproduce all by themselves. They have to have a worm print to reproduce. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> okay. Um, the main consideration when um, locating your worm bin um, is that they have to be in the shade and they have to be in a cool area. Um, or you can keep it in your kitchen, whatever works for you. <laughs> I'm not sure what that is about, but I guess it's proving that they really um, aren't smelly and can be in your house and you wouldn't notice. Um, but they cannot get um, too hot, so they have to be under a tree, they've got to be under a patio, a porch. If you have 
a laundry room. I know we don't have a lot of basements in our area. If you have a basement, that could work. Um, and in the summer months, especially over the hill and in our mountain towns, when it starts to get pretty hot, you might have to bring your worm bin inside your house if you don't have a garage that's cool enough or a basement um, so that they live where you live. And if you are managing your worm bin properly, um, there won't be any issues with it. It won't be smelly. Worms do not want to escape and leave their habitat. They want to be where their food is. And in the winter, sometimes um, if it's a really rainy season, I will just bring my worm bin in. One year we um, had nights that were so cold, our bird bath completely froze over. Um, and that year we brought our worm bin in and it sits right next to our dining room table because we live in a tiny home. And nobody knew that they were sitting next to a worm bin and having their dinner unless we pointed it out. Um, so just make sure that it's a shady area and you also have to uh, check the sun and how it changes throughout the year because you might have your worms in a shady place in the winter, but that may no longer be a shady place in the summer. So you might have to adjust it according to season, but they, they have to be in a shady and cool as possible place. All right. So now we're going to discuss um, worm food and what you would want to add to your uh, worm bin. And um, I think a good connection uh, to make here is that if it was once a plant, your worms can eat it. And that is anywhere from food scraps to paper to even a cotton t-shirt. Um, one thing that I like to do for classrooms is in the worm bin that I take to classrooms, I will put an old t-shirt in the worm bin and it's really fun for the students to pull it out and see what stage of decomposition it's in. And eventually all that will be left in that worm bin is the kind of polyester band that we have at the top of the t-shirts. And when the kids find that, that's very exciting for them to pull that out and know that the whole t-shirt has been eaten. It also helps uh, kids to remember that, oh yeah, cotton was once a plant and that's how we have this t-shirt. Um, to go through some examples of our vegetables and food scraps we just have you know the very few of the things that you could add into your worm bin banana peels apple cores lettuce potato peels carrot tops really most things um, if it's veggie that you're preparing for your dinner um, we like to remind people um, to cut your food scraps into small pieces um, because the worms kind of need the food scraps to start decomposing to be able to digest them. Worms don't have teeth, so they're not going to bite into that food scrap. They kind of need a little bit of the uh, decomposition process to already be starting. And I think a good visual is that they kind of have an, an elephant truck trunk that comes and kind of sucks in that decomposing matter into their body and then starts processing it that way. But they're not going to come up and take a bite out of that apple peel. So the smaller, the better, because it's going to start decomposing for them faster. Um, you can use some leftover pasta. You could throw them some cooked beans. Um, you can throw in coffee grounds along with the paper filters, um, tea leaves. If your tea bags don't have staples in them, you can just throw the whole thing in. They'll eat the string, the paper, you know, the filter, and the tea leaves. You can throw in paper towels, even soiled ones, as long as it's food. Um, they can't um, tolerate any harsh chemicals, like if you, you know, cleaned your bathroom with bleach or something in a paper towel, that cannot go into your worm bin. Um, egg cartons, and then for their grit, um, a really great thing to give them about once a month is a sprinkling of eggshells. Um, we eat eggs almost daily in our house. I just keep a bowl of eggshells and about once a month I run them through my blender and I save them either for my tomatoes or my worms. And um, if it's for the tomatoes, about once a month I go out there and give them a little sprinkling of those crushed eggshells. And next slide. 
in, in this slide, we are going to discuss um, what to avoid putting into your worm bin. And the main thing that we want to avoid is any sort of animal products. And that, of course, is meat, um, bones, skin of an animal, uh, dairy products, cheese, milk, yogurt. And it's not that the worms couldn't get through those products because they could, they actually could. Um, and there are some places um, that like to do it just to prove that it's done. The problem with it is that um, it gets very smelly. And also you're attracting some backyard friends to your worm bin that you might rather not, um, like wood rats, rats, mice, raccoons that are gonna try to break into your worm bin because it smells so good to them. Um, we won't add any sort of pet waste from carnivores or cats and dogs um, because, you know, that could lead to some disease issues. No heavy oils. They can't process any sort of plastic. Um, so one thing to keep in mind if you are going to shred paper, that little plastic window that you see sometimes in um, your bill envelopes, that can't go into your worm bin. They, they won't be able to digest that. So you have to rip that out before you put it through your paper shredder. Um, if you're a person like me that's allergic to everything under the sun, um, be careful with breads because um, if they don't go through it quick enough, um, it can get a little bit moldy and then that can um, be some issues for you when you're working in your worm bin. We suggest that you avoid seeds and nuts um, with hard shells and that's mostly hard holes and shells. That's mostly because it takes a really long time for them to break down. And sometimes in that beautiful rich compost, um, they sprout instead. Um, worms don't take kindly to too much um, acid or pungent foods in their worm bin and examples of that would be lemon and lime, orange, ginger, and onion and garlic. And I'm a lady that likes to have things proven to her. I don't necessarily believe things just because you tell me um, it's true. So I decided to do a test one day and in the center of my worm bin I put in a garlic bulb and some onion. And I went and checked on my worm bin the next day and they were all up on the walls in the worm bin on the top of the lid trying to get the heck away from that garlic and those onions. So it's true, they don't like it. Um, when it comes to uh, citrus, you can give them some citrus. And a good example is if you are going to make a piece of fish and you're just gonna squeeze, you know, a wedge of lemon on top of your fish, that can go in your worm bin. But if you're going to make a, a pitcher of lemonade, that cannot uh, go into your worm bin. Um, we like to avoid yard clipping just because a lot of times it's been treated with stuff that would hurt your worms. If you have a teeny, um, tiny about amount of soil, you could add it to your worm bin. Like for us gardeners, maybe we get down to like a little tiny bit of soil that's just not enough to put in a pot or we don't need to add it to our garden. Um, you could add that, um, but it's not something that they need in the worm bin. Um, and um, too much of it could be a problem. So just a little tiny bit if you felt like you needed to do that. Okay. So now we're going to talk a little bit about bedding material and um, the most commonly used bedding material is shredded newspaper. And um, if you go ahead and go out in town and get some of our free newspapers around town, a good way to shred that is to kind of uh, unfold it and let it lay lengthwise and then you just tear it from the top and it'll just tear down into these really nice strips and you've got your shredded newspaper. If you just kind of try to pull it apart, it's just going to come off in handfuls and probably get a little bit um, frustrating. Um, some people still put them through a shredder. I, I, I don't uh, see the need for that. It just takes a few minutes to shred your own newspaper. We do have to be careful with magazines and any sort of glossy insert that might be inside of a newspaper because sometimes those have a wax coating or um, they don't have natural inks and um, that's not healthy for your worms and they can't get through that. 
Another great example of bedding material would be shredded cardboard, old pizza boxes, um, pours from paper and toilet rolls, cardboard from all of our Amazon boxes that we were um, recently getting <laughs> during our, our COVID times. Um, and then, of course, you know, shredded junk mail, um, you know, the credit card bill you don't want your partner to see. Just give those to the worms. They'll never know. Um, in this, um, it's talking about you could add some decomposed leaves if you wanted to. That um, is something that you can very quickly add too much of, and then they can't break it down. So it's on there as something that you could do, but I don't recommend it. I recommend just staying um, with the carbon, just staying with um, your uh, shredded newspaper mostly and or um, cardboard. Um, if you live over the hill, um, a good source of worms is the worm dude in San Jose and Sonoma Valley Worm Farm. For us that live in Santa Cruz County, I've noticed that San Lorenzo has been getting regular shipments of red wigglers, so that's a good place to go ahead and pick them up. I've also seen them at the smaller nurseries in town. But honestly, if you have a friend that is already vermicomposting, um, come harvest time, they're probably going to want to make uh, two worm bins at that time, and maybe they've already got enough worm bins going and they will be able to give you some worms. Um, I also have had friends come over um, when we are able to travel around and go to schools. I have several worm bins going because I am uh, typically helping a classroom get started with a worm bin and honestly someone can come on by and I can give them a handful of worms into their bedding and, and start their worm bin there. So you don't necessarily have to purchase them. There's probably a way that you can find them um, from a friend and be able to do it for free. But, you know, our local nurseries do have them at this time of year. Okay, in this slide, we're talking about putting it all together. And uh, really, you know, when we look at this side, this slide, we're finding out that, you know, our worms are another living creature just like us, and they need very similar things like we do. Um, they need some sort of shelter, and in this case, it is their bedding. Um, they need air, just like we do, and that's by making sure that we have good ventilation in the worm bins. They won't last long without food, just like us, so they need some food. And if we want them to reproduce, they need some other worm friends to be able to make that happen. Um, worms can't live in a dry environment. They have to have a moist environment. and a good example of what we mean by that is a really wrung out sponge, you know, that you can pick up and it's damp, but you really can't squeeze a ton of water that's gonna come dripping out of that sponge. That's kind of the level of moisture that you want in your worm bin. And of course, um, we need to make sure that they have a little bit of grit. Like we said earlier, a good source of that is eggshells, coffee grounds, um, a little tiny bit of sand if, if, if need be so that they can digest their food. And in this slide, we're gonna talk about maintaining your worm bin. And this is fairly easy because most of this maintenance happens when you feed your worm bin. So um, most of us deliver food to our worms weekly, sometimes um, every two weeks, it just depends. But when you're taking out your food scraps to your worms, that's just a good time to make sure that the shady spot that you picked is providing nice shade for your worms and um, to check and see if they have gotten through the food that you gave them the last time and that it's disappearing. And if not, then it might not be time to feed them again. If you overfeed your worms, um, that's when your worm bin can get kind of smelly and icky because they can't process too much food all at once. 
Um, it's also a good time to check if the bedding is dry and add water with a spray bottle, not by pouring it in, you know, from the sprinkler hose, just a little tiny bit of water at a time. Um, honestly, you probably will never have to add water to your worm bin because food scraps come with a lot of water. And as I said earlier, most often our biggest uh, issue in the worm bin is too much moisture, um, not a lack of moisture. Um, if for some reason you've added too many fruits or veggies that have too much moisture, or sometimes I, I, I have friends that are big juicers and they like to add that pulp to the the bin and you've gotten your bin just way too wet, you can just add some carbon to help soak that up um, by um, um, adding some dry bedding uh, back to our shredded newspaper or cardboard and that will help absorb the excess moisture and kind of balance it out for them. And once again, reminding you to add some grit every month. One thing to keep in mind is that domesticated worms are your pets and you have to care for them like you do pets. So if you are going on vacation, um, you need to make sure that they're going to be in a shady spot while you're away, and you might need to give them some extra food. You might wanna go ahead and spray a little bit of water on them to make sure that they're gonna stay nice and moist while you're gone. And um, one good nice little trick for making sure that they have enough food is to just give them a whole something, um, like maybe a whole apple or a whole, whole potato with some holes punctured in it so they can kind of start um, being able to move in and out of the fruit. And that might be able to cover them the whole time that you're gone. Um, if you're like me and um, you go on pretty long backpacking trips, then you have to good, find a good friend like Delise and make her take care of your worms because you're going to be gone too long and you have to make sure that someone is keeping them cool and feeding them on a regular basis. Just like if you were going to be gone for a long time and you, you had to find a pet sitter for your cat or dog. They're a responsibility, so you need to keep them alive. We're going to move into harvesting castings. Um, castings, um, aka worm poop, um, after a while can start to get too toxic for worms and they, they want to uh, get out of that situation. And a typical kind of good visual of when it's time to harvest your castings is when they've processed um, their bedding and the food scraps you've been giving them to about halfway up the bin that you're using. When you get to that halfway point, it's time to start thinking about harvesting them. Um, there are many ways to harvest, and of course it depends on what type of system that you're using. Um, if you bought one of those vertical systems, um, if the worms are behaving, um, then you'll take the lower layers of, of that system because they should be moved up into the top layers where you're feeding them. Um, some folks like to put in a screen inside their homemade worm bin and they only feed on one side of that homemade worm bin and when they feel like the castings are getting ready to be harvesting, harvested, then they start feeding on the other side of that worm bin and the worms will leave the vermicompost and head on over to the other side of the worm bin because that's where the food is and then you can harvest the castings that way. Um, we have a photo of the dump and sort. Um, this is what I do. I spread out a big huge tarp and I dump and sort my worm castings and worms hate the sun so they're going to freak out and try to get to the bottom of those piles and then you can come and just scoop off the top of those piles and put that finished compost into a container and then of course save your worms to put back into your worm bin to start the process over. And if you have the stacking trays, um, the oldest tray would be the one that you would remove, has the most compost, and then um, you would start a new system in a, in a new tray with new food. Um, there's one other thing to keep in mind. Um, if you're using one of those kind of layered systems, sometimes the bottom trays can dry out faster. So you'll need to be checking on those and make sure that they have proper moisture level. And no matter what, um, you will always have uh, 
red wigglers inside your castings. There'll always be a few that you need to um, remove however you want to and put back into your worm bin. Um, it's never going to be as easy as all the worms have moved over to this side of the bin and now you just have castings free of worms. There's always going to be some worms left in that casting that you need to sift out and save. All right, so using worm compost. Well, as we said in one of the first slides, um, worm castings are a slow release nitrogen rich fertilizer, the best fertilizer ever. And you can use it instead of fish emulsion on your bedding plants, in your greenhouse, spread right around your potted plants, your vegetable beds, your flower beds. It can be sifted into lawns. And if you are um, one of those folks that likes to make their own soil mix, you can um, add them into your soil mix. Of course, you can uh, dress your trees with worm uh, compost and um, gift it to your garden friends and you'll be the gardening rock star of the year. And um, also it's a great ingredient for compost tea and compost tea is probably one of my favorite ways to use my worm um, castings. Troubleshooting your worm bin. Um, a lot of times people have fruit flies in their worm bin and um, that bother, that's bothersome to them because they lift off the top of their worm bin and all the fruit flies come, come flying out. And um, a lot of times that's just easily solved by putting a piece of wet cardboard on top of your bedding and your food scraps and that prevents the fruit flies from going down and so they're not going to reproduce in that area. You might want to add some more dry bedding on top of the feed zone um, to kind of um, keep them at bay. Um, some folks like to do the vinegar trick. Uh, I wouldn't do that because I'd be afraid that I'd spill it and then make my, my compost too acidic. Um, one thing that we like you to know is that fruit flies are not a result of your worm bin. They have been transferred with your food scraps. So they were already present in your food scraps and you added them to the worm bin. <laughs> so a great way to avoid that happening is when you're collecting your food scraps, just make sure that you put them in a container that has a nice sealed lid on it and then you won't get the fruit flies um, to begin with and they won't be added to your worm bin. Worms die and um, the Number one reason for that is because they have been left in a sunny spot um, or it was too hot outside and they just overheat it. Um, I've actually had heard some tragic stories from master composters who have made that mistake. So we can't emphasize enough that they have to be in a shady spot and if it gets too hot outside, you've got to move them to a cooler place. Um, if you're out running errands and all of a sudden, like last year, we we're having those crazy days where all of a sudden it was like 110 degrees out of nowhere, a good way to uh, cool off your warm bin quickly is to add some ice cubes in there. And that's a nice little trick to keep in mind. Um, another thing that might be the reason that you have some worms dying in your warm bin is because you've allowed the bedding to dry out. And Another big one is uh, that they haven't been fed. And sometimes people put their worms bins behind the garage or behind the shed and they forget about them. And they forget that they are supposed to be once a week taking their food scraps to their worm bin and they die because no one's fed them. So don't be mean to your worms, they're your pets, love them and make sure that you're giving them water and food so that they can survive. All right, so this is the um, point of the presentation that if we were able to be in person, we would make a worm bin together. So we're gonna turn it into a little bit of a show and tell. And then after that, um, I'm going to answer your questions that you have been sending to uh, Delise and Denise. So and I, I recommend you all go to uh, speaker view so you can see what mm. Bridget's up to. All right, hopefully. 
hopefully everyone's done that. And the first thing that I want to show you is a beautiful sample of worm castings. So these are worm castings in a mason jar. If we were sitting in class, I would be passing it around and asking you to feel it and smell it. it smells amazing. It smells like rich soil. Gorgeous product that you made yourself from your own food scraps. And then I'm going to talk about some hand tools. Um, I like to bring out my butcher knife just to remind you that when you're prepping your food, um, make sure that you're um, prepping your food into nice small pieces so that your worms can take advantage of the food source quicker. If you're going to go out into the garden and let's say it's time to take down your tomato plants and you want to cut them up and give them to your worms, you're going to have to break out your trusty pruners and get them down into nice small sizes before you put them into your worm bin. And it wouldn't hurt to also give them a little whack um, with a small hammer so we can get some bruising going and help the decomposition process get going. Okay. Um, we are going to talk about making a worm bin. So I have these smaller storage bins that I can fit into the camera so that you can see them. And we'll just pretend that this is the bigger size bin that we saw in the photos. And also um, for the right family, this is a, a great size worm bin that you could keep under your kitchen sink if you wanted to. So first of all, you're gonna decide on what size worm bin you want and go purchase that from the box store and or hopefully just get one from your shed or your garage. And you're gonna need to drill in some drainage holes in the bottom of your worm bin. And you're also gonna have to go around the top and drain in, drill in some air holes on the top of the worm bin so that they can breathe. I prefer worm bins that have locking tops. Like I said earlier, I live in Watsonville. I live between two horse properties. We've got all the critters. And with these uh, locking tops, my worm bins can be outside and I don't need to worry about raccoons or rats or anybody trying to break into my worm bin. So inside your worm bin, when you're first um, putting it together, you're gonna add some pre-moistened moistened, worm bedding. And these are shredded up paper bags from the grocery store from when we weren't allowed to bring our own bags in. So I've saved those to start new worm bins with and also occasionally feed my worms with. So I've got my nice little pre-moistened worm bedding. And then with that goes your little baby worms into the worm bin from the pound of worms that you bought. Boop, they go on in there. And that's it. You close this up for a while and they're just gonna work on their bedding for a little bit. And you don't need to feed them for a few weeks. And then when it comes time to feed them, I've got some examples of things that you might wanna add to your warm bin. Um, this is some green leafy vegetables that they'll love. Um, that were remnants of the salad that I made last night. Um, a nice big old coffee filter with coffee inside of it. Yay, grit and the paper, they're gonna love that. And then a tea bag with no staple or anything so the whole thing can just go in. And then um, since I'm a really good uh, worm keeper, I'm gonna go ahead and give them some crushed eggshells also so they have that grit so that they can process the food that I have given them. And on top of that, I'm gonna go ahead and put a wet piece of cardboard or a few wet pieces of newspaper, which helps keep them cool and also um, helps keep out um, any other sort of, you know, gnats or like we were talking about earlier, fruit flies that you don't wanna develop inside your worm bin. So that goes on top and I seal my worm bin and I'm good to go and I feed them at weekly or every couple of weeks, whatever uh, works out for my particular family size and how much veggies we eat. And then you need to think about where are you gonna keep your worm bin? If you're gonna keep your worm bin outside, then this worm bin can just sit on top of a couple of two by fours or an old wood pallet um, so that it can drain properly from the drainage holes in the bottom. And also that helps in the aeration process too. But if you wanna keep it inside 
your garage, as my English friend would say, or um, your shed or your laundry room, you're going to want to get yourself a second worm bin that's the same size. And inside that worm bin, you're going to put a nice flat rock or a couple more pieces of leftover wood. And you're not going to drill any holes in the bottom of this bin. And you're going to go ahead and put your worm bin inside of that. So you've got this two worm bin system. And that rock or the pieces of wood that you have in there helps the, this worm bin, your working worm bin, not sink too low into the worm bin that you're putting it into. It helps keep the air holes exposed so they can still breathe. It also helps not create this like suction situation where it's almost impossible to get this out when it's time to harvest. And that means that nothing's going to come out of the bottom of this. So you can keep it next to your kitchen table, like I do in the winter, or in your garage, or in um, your laundry room, and not worry about anything leaking out from the bottom. Another thing to keep in mind is there might come a time where you've decided that you want to add a second worm bin. So what you're going to do in that case is you'll take a another worm bin and you'll just do the same thing you're going to drill some aeration holes drainage holes in the bottom you're going to drill um, holes around the top of it and you're going to go ahead and let the worms um, process most of the food and bedding that you've given them in the first bin and when that looks like it's about time to harvest you go ahead and put your second bin on top of that and the worms will crawl through the holes up into the new food source and after some time you'll be able to come and take this top worm bin out and then you'll have your finished compost in the bottom worm bin there'll still be worms in there that you'll have to sift out but most of them will be up on top where you're feeding your worms and you can also do a double system inside your house. You just make, have to make sure that you've got a third bin on the bottom that doesn't have holes so it's not gonna leak you know, on the, the floors of your home. Um, one thing that I like to do, we talked earlier about is to uh, make compost tea. And I do a pretty simple process and I just have a a uh, five gallon bucket uh, that I picked up from one of our box stores. And inside this five gallon bucket will go a couple handfuls of my finished compost and a couple teaspoons of molasses because that helps get some nice microbial action going. And since I'm a fancy pants, I also like to use a bubbler that I just picked up from the pet store. And that helps add aeration to your compost tea and just kind of speeds up the process. And in 24 to 48 hours, you've got a beautiful compost tea to work with. I learned a trick um, at a farm I spent some time with recently where when they make their compost tea in their greenhouse with their veggie and fruits and veggie starts, they just keep this little tiny um, bucket inside their worm castings and they just pull it out and then feed their babies that way with their worm castings. That was brilliant. I started doing that at home. And once your plants get big enough and you're out in the pots or in your veggie bed, then you might want to switch to a sprayer system, uh, which I love to foliar feed my plants with uh, compost tea. In this case, you will need to filter uh, the compost tea with some sort of cheesecloth mesh, um, old row cover, um, because if you don't do that, then you'll clog up your sprayer. And um, a reminder that worm castings are an organic all-purpose fertilizer that can be used on any plant. Um, they're a great source of calcium, magnesium, nitrogen, phosphate, potassium, and giving your plants um, a sufficient amount of uh, worm compost is an effective way to increase um, their pest and disease resistance. And I think it's one of the best things that you can do for your plants. My neighbor recently had a citrus tree, um, her Meyer tree that was on the way out and I saved it just by giving it some compost tea. 
um, literally two applications and it turned around. Um, this got some random um, accessories to talk about really quickly. This is just an example of a good spray bottle. If you do feel like your um, worm bin is getting dry, then you're just going to use something like this to add moisture to it. Once again, we're not going to do it from a hose nozzle or by dumping water in there because you probably need very, very little. Um, as Delise says, I just work with my worms. I'm not afraid of my worms. I don't wear gloves or anything like that. But some people would rather wear gloves and they'd rather not touch their worms. And if you're one of those people, then you can pick up one of these sifters and you can put your compost in there and, and sift your castings over a tub that you want to save your castings in. Eventually you'll see your little baby worms and then you put that back in your worm bin. I like to keep my um, food scraps on my porch. And because of that, I got myself a little nice locking trash can. And I just um, put my food scraps, my used paper towels from the week, from um, cleaning up after, you know, making dinner, um, shred some bills in there. And I've got like a practically a little compost system working in here, but I can just walk this out to my worms. And that wraps up show and tell. And uh, it is now time to answer your questions. <laughs> okay, this is the main question, but um, let's see. We have someone named Carrie who's been using something called a sub pod. Have you ever heard of that? I have not heard of a sub pod, I'm sorry. I actually found a picture of one and I'll see if I can drag it out. Okay. There, have you ever seen this thing? It looks pretty cool. Oh, that you put directly into, into your garden bed? Carrie, do you wanna unmute and talk about it? Sure, uh, hi, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, so um, we, I don't even know how I heard about one. I think I heard about it from a friend and um, so we, we got it last August. It goes right into, um, that's actually a really good picture because our, ours is the same way. It's in a raised bed. And um, so it's, it's underground and nice. there's two sides. And, but you're right though, like they, they don't completely empty into one side and leave the other with no, there's still worms on both sides. So yes. you still kind of have to work with that a little bit, but, but um. But what I like about it is that it's, uh, it already has the holes in it. You don't have to drill. Um, and you can see on the lid, they've got little, you know, the suggestions for things that are okay to put in and things that aren't. Um, so for a newbie, that was really helpful. Um, and they have different bundles that they offer. So like we got the one that has the aerator, which is like this metal spiral that, you know, you twist in there and then lift up and it, and you can um, aerate really, really easily that way. So yeah, I don't know. It's, it's a little pricey, but not too bad really considering the time savings of, of not having to drill and yeah. Can we ask how much it cost? You know, I'm trying to remember, I want to say close to $200. Like it might've been 150, but then with the bundle with the aerator, it was probably closer to 200. I don't I remember exactly. It's pretty pricey. Yeah. Well, I, haven't, I haven't seen that particular system before, but we do have some master composters that actually use um, these uh, five gallon buckets with a bunch of holes drilled in them. And they bury these five gallon buckets inside their raised beds and put their <laughs> composting material inside them and then all the goodies leach out from from the bucket and also it reminds me of the ancient roman keyhole system where your garden is basically shaped in a keyhole and you're kind of adding your composting into the center of that and then all the goodies are leaching out from that area into the keyhole the garden around it mm -hmm. great system yeah thanks for sharing yeah you're welcome yeah thanks for that uh, we had a question about peanut shells, if they're unsalted, is that okay to add? Uh, I haven't heard anything specifically on peanut shells. Um, definitely want them to be unsalted, but it probably goes back to um, the warning against hard um, nuts and shells just because it takes them a long time to process. It's probably one of those things that a little bit is okay, but maybe not a bag of peanut shells. Um, that might 
might be better for a, a compost pile um, if there's going to be a lot of them, just because it just might be uh, something that takes them a while to get through. Great. Now, we just are not getting a whole lot of questions, but I have had some epic failures that I'd like to report on. <laughs> tell me how I, what I could have done differently. So as you know, Bridget, I have a can of worms. That's that stacking round bin. Uh, always tips over. It's a real pain in the neck. But um, I keep trying to get it to, to work. And one year, I didn't have it covered. And it rained really hard. And I didn't have the valve closed or open. So there's a valve at the bottom that allows it to drain. And they all drown. And it was a horrible carnage site. So that's that's the tip of the week on that one um and i also find that they they just never seem to leave the lower layer they it, so, <laughs> well they don't have eyes so they can't read the directions that's so what they i'm, I'm totally didn't read the directions so um, your tip they, of taking the lower level and putting it on top and and taking the lid off that has worked pretty well for me Oh, good. I mean, I, I had that system for a while. I, I eventually just grew, grew too frustrated with it and gave that to a neighbor. Um, in the rainy season, you know, you have to remember to tarp it if it's raining. Um, we did get to where we just started bringing it in in the rainy season. Um, and that helped prevent any like, drowning. Um, but you just have to kind of work with what you got and if you like it figure out tricks of the trade that work for you but they don't necessarily perform how they're supposed to in those tiered systems and um you need to um figure out if you like it enough to keep it and then figure out your own tricks that helps it be successful for you yeah we used to we used to have a rainy season <laughs> and then um a couple of us want to know how long does it take from starting your worm bin to, to harvesting worm castings? That's another one of those it depends questions. Um, it really depends on the size of your worm bin and also how much you're feeding it. Um, I want to say, you know, you typically aren't going to have anything to harvest for at least three months. Um, some people only harvest their castings twice a year. It, it really depends on how much food you're giving them and the size of your container. Um, my worm bin is one of more of those uh, big storage containers that you get, you know, at any of the box stores. And I, I harvest it when um, the castings are about halfway up that. And it really depends on how much food I've been giving them and also um, what their population is. And if they've been getting a lot of food, they've got a pretty good population going of worms. Um, but I would still say that you're probably not going to see much worth trying to harvest for at least three months um, and maybe in the four to six south. Great. Um, my biggest complaint is that I don't get enough worm castings. I, I, I know one fellow who is kind of a crazy guy but he has, you can kind of do any size, it seems. He has a complete hot tub that he has sunken into the ground and he's, the entire thing is a worm bin. Wow. So um, is he a production farmer? Does he sell his worms? No, he's just a madman. Uh, oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, there are people that have big, huge systems um, that want to grow a lot of worms, but it's typically because um, they're selling them. Um, in our most recent master composting meeting this past week, um, there um, is some research being done by a, by a grad student who spoke with us from Davis, who is developing a way to use earthworms as a water filtration system. So mm -hmm. his system is pretty huge. Um, that was fascinating. Um, there's also some folks that um, use earthworms as, as an addition, um, uh, an addition to a, a, a home composting toilet that isn't using water um, to finish off uh, the 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 process of the home, home composting toilet. And there's all kinds of, of of ways to to use worms 
and of course your your production can be whatever you want it to be this past year you know i went down to worm one worm box because it was just us and we weren't teaching in person anymore but when i am going up to san jose a lot and teaching often and um, i'm on the school team and i'm going to classrooms where i'm basically there to help that classroom set up a worm bin system sometimes i have four or five bins going so that i always have enough worms to give to a classroom so it just depends on what you're doing, but I would, I would say, um, list that damn worm bin on Craigslist and let some other poor person have a headache with it and get yourself, <laughs> get yourself a homemade worm bin. And then you're going to um, see much happier worms. And I, I bet you're going to get a lot more worms. I think I'm sold. Um, so we have somebody that came late. Um, we talked about the types of worms you can use and the types you shouldn't use. Can you go over that slide really quickly again and um, talk about red worms? Is there anything besides red worms? That there, are, there are several different composting worms that will work in a home composting system because there's, you know, just, it's the slide before that, Delise. Um, there's just thousands and thousands of worms, um, but they have to be surface dwelling worms. They have to be, if we found them in nature, they're living in the leaf litter. They're living on top of the surface of the soil. They're not burrowing worms. And in our area, um, University of California has deemed that a red wiggler is the best worm for us. Um, but I also gave an example. There is a worm called the blue worm that looks exactly like the red wiggler. It's just this gorgeous turquoise blue. Um, but that worm only works if you're living in a very humid tropical climate because that's where that worm lives. Um, so it just depends on what um, part of the planet you're living in to what surface type composting worm you would use. And I, I think the main thing to remember is that for us, it's red wigglers. Great. Um, okay, let me read this one. When somebody, uh, when using a commercial um, plastic worm bin, what do you do with the liquid that collects on the bottom? What's that stuff called at the bottom? The uh, exudate at the bottom is a fancy term for, um, you know, their digestive juices um, that are leaking through. And that is, uh, some people um, will just take that and maybe spread it around the base of a tree or something like that. It is not something um, that you can make worm composting tea with. Some people uh, think that um, that is a good use. That is not what you make worm composting tea with. That's a mistake. You make worm comp composting tea with your worm castings. Um, that stuff is um, a lot of times anaerobic and um, not going to do much for you anyway. And sometimes it's a little rancid and toxic if you let it sit there too long. So best to just kind of spread it around um, a tree or some bushes, um, but you, you're not going to make composting tea with that or put it, you know, in um, your veggie bed. Is it, is it, so it's dangerous, you wouldn't use it on a food uh, vegetable? type crop. I wouldn't, no. Okay. Ornamentals. Yep. Ever have issues with ants in worm bins? I haven't had um, very many issues with ants in my worm bin. Um, I'm not sure what that would um, be um, coming from. Um, I have not dealt with that um, myself and it's not uh, something that we have talked about extensively in our composting group either. Um, it might be that you know the worms are not processing the food that you're giving it quick enough so there's enough goodies for the ants to get up in there. My worm bin, my ants would have a lot of trouble getting into my worm bin because I have a locking lid and I also put a weight on top of it. Um, but if it's a huge problem, it might be something, you know, that you might need to consider, you know, placing an ant bait at the uh, bottom, you know, area of your worm bin. Um, but I, I haven't heard of that being too big of an issue very often. I have had raccoons get into my worm bin. <laughs> yes. And especially the ones they can just knock over. <laughs> yeah, exactly. 
All right, you guys, we've got 10 more minutes if we want to have any more question and answer time. Um, Let me um, check the chat and see if there's anything. Um, my next, oh, sorry. I was going to say my next door neighbor had a, a booming uh, worm bin going really well. She also had, and uh, it bothered her, soldier fly larva. Um, comments yeah. about that. I, she gave them to me for my chickens, so that was okay for me, but... Uh, just if it's a problem. Um, it's not a problem. And when you, you take uh, the lid off, oftentimes when they're ready, they're just going to fly. Um, but they're, they're not going to uh, take out your worms or anything like that. There's a lot of composters that, are, that might find their way into your worm bin. And they're, they're composting for you, too. Um, so you might uh, uh, occasionally see, you know, what we used to call when I was growing up, roly-poly bugs in your worm bin. You might, a slug might occasionally find its way into it. Sometimes I've had, like, the big daddy earthworms decide, hey, this is a good place for me to hang out. Um, when I see those guys, I will remove them just because they're competing with the food sources that I'm getting my red wigglers. But any sort of, like, flying insect, oftentimes um, it was just a good place for it to hang out until it's ready to fly and you open the lid and it goes away. All right. I would like to, um, I would like to ask everybody on the call to um, help us improve. We are always trying to improve. And this, I think it's been a fabulous, fabulous presentation, especially because you brought all those objects to show us on screen. That was really fun. <laughs> So we do an evaluation survey after every um, uh, every class, and Denise is going to copy that into the chat right now. So if you would go to this uh, form and fill it out, it's maybe five minutes, probably not, and that would be helpful. The other helpful thing that's going to happen is you're going to get an email survey in from the California Master Gardeners. It's not going to be for another couple of weeks. And they're going to ask you, did you use what you learned in this class? And what they do with the data that they get back from that is they, they get funding. They get, they are demonstrating that they're making a difference in people's lives. So that's very important to respond to. And we appreciate you um, answering that when it comes to you in your email. And then because you've come to this class, we'll be, you'll be on our email list and we will send you email and let you know when other classes are happening and other events. And if you don't wanna be on that email list, you can always opt out. But we're working on some classes. They're not scheduled yet, but um, coming soon, uh, gray water class, laundry to landscape. Uh, we're working on a, a um, class on growing food in small spaces. It started as a container gardening class but it looks like it's going to be just, you know, a limited space or apartment dwellers um, kind of food production class. And then we have a, a really fantastic presentation that we're hoping to re repurpose for the public um, on hummingbirds and hummingbird plants and how to keep them in your yard all year round. So we're very interested, if you don't mind putting in the, in the chat, any classes that you are interested that we present, because we are working on lots of different ideas. So we will follow up. Um, we will follow up with you by email after the class. We'll send you the uh, recording. We'll send you the presentation. And you'll have all of these links at home. Um, if you have any issues with your worm bin, you can, you can uh, contact the ROT line, which I love. That's in Santa Clara. <laughs> We're promoting a different master gardener group, but that's fine. Or you can call our UC or um, Santa Cruz and Monterey master gardener hotline. And that's um, an online question answering service that will answer almost any question. And um, Bridget has given us a couple of more great resources. So <laughs> thank you all. This has been really fun for me. I hope it's been fun for you. And we look forward to seeing you on the next uh, class or event. Thank you, Denise. Thank you, Bridget. All right. Thank you, everyone, Thanks, for joining sorry. us. And happy Mother's Day.
Happy Mother's Day, and I wish you great success with your worm bins. Yay, <laughs> worms. Alrighty, thank you guys.